Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today uh, for our inaugural uh, skills building webinar uh, sponsored by SUNY School of Public Health and Health Policy and the Harlem Health Initiative, which is a brand new initiative under the Dean's Office to engage in and work with community-based organizations and associations to help strengthen and build our public health infrastructure in Harlem and beyond. My name is Deborah Levine, and I am the director of the Harlem Health Initiative, and I welcome you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I will start by letting you know that today we are joined by two of our esteemed uh, faculty members and colleagues who will take us through a basic conversation around community-based participatory research, how it can help our community. We'll have a question and answer session, and you also have an opportunity to talk with your colleagues and uh, share some ideas. This is going to be one of many skills building webinar series that we will be offering through the course of the year. I'd like to take the opportunity to also thank our partners this morning, Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement, the Hope Center, Community Board 11, and the uh, Herbert Irving Comprehensive Con um, Cancer Center. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over this morning to Dr. Manzo, Dr. Pam. Please welcome and thank you. Your lines will be muted uh, until the question and answer period. Great, thanks, Deborah. Uh, my name is Chris Palmado. I am a clinical professor in the Department of Community Health and Social Sciences at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, where I teach courses in health communication and social marketing. Uh, I direct the uh, Master's of Science program in Health Communication for Social Change at our school. And uh, we are so fortunate to have Deborah with us uh, and the Harlem Health Initiative as part of our school. Um, so I will uh, tell you a little bit about what we're doing today and then turn it over to uh, Professor Meredith Manzi, who will tell you about um, a little overview of CBPR, community-based participatory research. I will then uh, provide three brief examples of some stories, including one that I was uh, privileged enough to be involved in um, about five or 10 years ago. And then we will have a brief breakout session. So this is a relatively introductory session. Uh, and if we, uh, if we have not presented any really new information for you, you'll still have a chance to learn something by uh, being broken out into groups of three and meeting some of the other participants and sharing some ideas that you might have, some suggestions you might have. Uh, just a little bit of a brief brainstorming for about five minutes about what you might think are opportunities for CBPR in your communities, in your entities, your institutions. And then after that brief five minutes, we'll, we'll come back and then we'll open it up to questions, comments, and then uh, Deborah will take us home, some final thoughts and allow us to um, reach out to, uh, to Deborah. Uh, and you're certainly welcome to reach out to, to me and Meredith as well. So um, uh, some of my, uh, just a, bit, a little bit more on myself, some of my recent research um, could now be considered community-based participatory research. Uh, it's in collaboration with a local organization, Bronx HealthReach. And it's a, a great interest of mine, uh, which is reducing children's consumption uh, of uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, a toxic soda that is very heavily marketed to communities that disproportionately suffer from um, diabetes, obesity, uh, and other health conditions that connect are very closely connected to those products. Um, and uh, I want to address the racial and ethnic targeting, targeted marketing. Um, but the CBPR lens reminds me that it's not about me and my interest and my privilege to do this work. It's really um, the, about the community. And if the community partner wants, the community wants to partner with beverage companies and do some other stuff, then I need to support that. So that's a little bit about my uh, work and my introduction and what we're going to do today. And now I would like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Manzi. Meredith, uh, we'll take over and I'll come back. Hi everyone, I'm Meredith Manzi, also in the Community Health Department with Chris at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health. 
And um, a little bit about my background, my research has mainly focused on sexual and reproductive health and healthcare, specifically contraception and family planning, and more recently in ways that we can support college students with children. So I teach courses at the Graduate School in Research Methods and Grant Writing and try to incorporate community engaged work wherever I can. Um, that being said, I am a continual student of CBPR, certainly not someone I would consider an expert. Um, I've worked on many projects that have ranged from not at all CBPR to community engaged to you know, more like CBPR fully. But I continue to learn and I'm excited to be a part of this discussion today. So just to start, I know Deborah gave a brief overview of the Harlem Health Initiative, um, but I just wanna highlight here that the Harlem Health Initiative really centers community voices and that's um, what we're hoping to, to help do here today with this workshop. So what is CBPR? Uh, there's been a lot of terms and definitions that have evolved over time. It's not a specific research method. It's not that, you know, should I engage in CBPR? Should we be doing surveys or focus groups? Um, but it's more of an orientation to research. So this is one of the more um, widely used definitions, which is it being a collaborative approach to research that equitably involves all partners in the research process and recognizes the unique strengths that each brings. CBPR begins with a research topic of importance to the community with the aim of combining knowledge and action for social change to improve community health and eliminate health disparities. So to me, this encompasses what I consider to be the three most fundamental parts of CBPR in that it is one, community driven, two, an equitable partnership with researchers, and three, it leads to action and some sort of positive change. So for over a century, communities and particularly communities of color have been the subjects of racist research protocols driven by academics. Um, so at worst, coerced into unethical studies without consent or knowledge like in Tuskegee, but even less extreme, but just as misguided has been our exclusion of community members from the research process itself. So CBPR has, has been born out of this history um, in response to the mystery communities and it understands that it centers these priorities and their decision making. So here are the 10 principles of CBPR. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of them, but just to note that, that in each of them, community partners and their role are really prominent and highlighted. Um, so a few of the ones that I think um, really speak to the root of CBPR building on the strengths and resources within the community, facilitating a collaborative equitable partnership, having there being co-learning and capacity building, balancing research and action, not just research for research sake, um, problems that are of local relevance, understanding with an ecological perspective that people exist within their families, communities, the social and physical environment, um, political environment, et cetera disseminating findings, being committed to have them be sustainable and embracing cultural humility and recognizing that none of us can ever really master another person's culture, but um, we can be committed to learning, to self critique, to addressing power imbalances and reflecting on all the ways that racism, classism and other means function to repress certain voices. And with these principles comes a commitment to continual evaluation um, of these throughout the process. Of course, it takes time and commitment on all parties' parts to build and execute all of these. So this is uh, the ideal, something to strive for. I wanted to take a few moments to talk about how CBPR doesn't work. Um, it, we talk a lot in, about how, how it does work and how it can work, um, but I think it's important to take a step back and I've termed some of these complexes and approaches myself, but there are things that I've seen and have even been guilty of, I'm sure at various times, um, and they're not mutually exclusive, but this is how research has tried to work in the past, but I think ultimately, broadly speaking, has failed because communities weren't centered or even involved in the research process. So the first is the Superman complex, um, which is a researcher coming in 
thinking that they can, you know, save a community, um, which is speaking to this quote by Leela Watson, the art activist and artist. Um, so for example, I work in, have been involved in the family planning research world for a long time. And historically, our focus had been on reducing unintended pregnancies, which was this construct that we created. Um, and to say that people reported having mistimed or unwanted pregnancies and unintended pregnancies end up being more prevalent among people of color and low income. So it creates a situation whereby we created something and uh, then deem it a problem and intervene to you know, help reduce pregnancies in these communities in a way that can obviously be construed as problematizing pregnancies among people of color. And in light of the you know, gross historical reproductive coercion and control of women of color is certainly at best misguided. So there's been a recent shift from focusing on, you know, quote unquote, saving this community um, to promoting reproductive autonomy and helping anyone get pregnant or, or not get pregnant when they want. The second is the you know, doctor knows best phenomenon whereby researchers think they know more than community members because of their training and academic knowledge. And um, so for example, if I were a researcher focused on cardiovascular outcomes, I might read a community health report or assessment and see that Harlem has high rates of heart disease. I might write a grant about that, get funded for an intervention that I think is going to work because I know about this issue and maybe I've even led other successful interventions in other communities, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I know how to do it in this one and that it's of real, of, of the highest importance to people in Harlem. The third is the all about me complex, um, which just involves understanding how academia is incentivized and evaluated. So we, we as academics are often evaluated by uh, the grant money that we bring in and the output in terms of writing grants and publications. Um, so in our school, we're also evaluated on other things like service to the community and the profession, to teaching, you know, obviously being a public university. But in many schools, research is what's valued the most. And it creates a system whereby researchers and academics are focused on our own tra career trajectory in these things versus maybe on the bigger picture of community health. So using the CBPR approach requires building trust. It takes a lot of time and investment. And some may not see this as a priority to succeed in academia. And certainly there have been many examples of people who have been you know, successful in their academic careers um, without ever involving community members in their research of interest. And then the last is the, the old, you know, thanks, bye, um, where researchers swoop into communities. And maybe this is even done in a CBPR-like way, um, but either doesn't lead to action um, or perhaps it does, and maybe there are successful interventions and programs created, but they're not anything that's sustainable without continued funding or their involvement. And researchers end up moving on to the next project, leaving communities not that much better off than when they began the process. So I share these not to dissuade you at all from engaging with academic partners, but just to be candid and to know about what competing priorities might exist and might be at play and just to offer some red flags to look for in evaluating research partners. And as a way of saying that you should be evaluating research partners and voicing any concerns as you see fit, you know, they, they need you. So, um, you know, you should feel sufficiently empowered to do that. When CBPR does work well, though, it can be tremendously valuable to communities. And we'll hear more from Chris about case studies, but it can involve you know, implementing evidence-based solutions to problems that are of actual importance to the community, to community feeling empowered over their own lives and to improving health and social equity. So thinking about if I were running a CBO or part of a community group that might be of interest to a researcher, here are some of the things that I would want to assess and discuss in a potential research partner. So to, to come to some sort of mutual understanding and agreement about how things are gonna work. The first, um, their motivations and goals. So I wanna assure that as a community partner, my goals are clear to partners and also understanding theirs. Funders um, have also been involved in this and um, you know, their priorities are something that you as a community partner really wanna understand. 
they've been increasingly aware of and even sometimes requiring community involvement which to some extent is good, but you wanna make sure that you and your involvement is not a checkbox to appease funders or the academic partners to say, you know, yes, this is community engaged because, you know, I emailed them one time. Um, you also wanna understand the processes, you know, what it's gonna look like, who's gonna be at the virtual table, who's gonna be making decisions, what are the outputs, um, what about funding for you, you know, if you're being asked to help with recruitment or even administer surveys, you know, it, you know, is there funding available to cover time for part of your staff? Um, and then also thinking about how you, as a community partner, do you have all of the appropriate community voices at the table that you feel like should be represented? Um, and sustainability, do, do researchers intend to apply for more funding? Is this a program that's expected to be absorbed into day-to-day -day operations that they wanna test? Um, and there might not be a sustainability plan, but you just want to know that up front um, to understand. So, um, so all this to say that you know these are things that you should certainly feel feel like you should be able to speak up about when goals and motivations don't align with yours or the community or ways that you think that this process should go and and how it should be sustainable, and not in a contentious way, but you just want to make sure that it's worth your time. And an investment and, and it will leave the community off in a better place than when you started this process. You know, if it's a relay race, you want to make sure that this project is, you know, kicking the can down the road, so to speak. So now I'm going to uh, turn it to Chris, who's going to present about a few CVPR case studies. Thank you. And I look forward to discussion and, and answering questions at the end. All right, I'm unmuted and there we go. All right, so thank you for uh, starting us off, Meredith. And I'm now going to share three examples uh, from uh, the past of CBPR projects. And this is sort of a reiteration of some of the things that Meredith said, but I just uh, want to sort of restate that there are some steps that are in common uh, among the, the examples I'm going to share. And essentially, probably it could be argued that they're in common among all good CBPR, effective CBPR projects. And those steps are starting that with, as Meredith has said, it's the community that defines the issue. Uh, it's not the academic institution. Uh, it's not the philanthropic institution. It's the community. And as we have known in the past, many of you probably have examples that you can share. Uh, this is often not the case. An academic is driven by uh, a, a grant that they want to chase after, uh, and a foundation decides they want to fund certain things. Uh, but the real way that sustainable, equitable, um, uh, anti-racist um, research is, is enacted is as when the community defines the issue that needs to be addressed. And then the second step is that the research partner is brought in to serve and collaborate with the community. Uh, again, not just the research partner doesn't decide what to do the research on uh, in an effective, equitable, community-based participatory research way. The research partner collaborates with the community. Uh, and, the com or, and or the community organization. And then after the research of the issue is defined and discussed um, and determined, then and the research is done, then an advocacy plan needs to be enacted to actually create policy change. Because in the end, community-based participatory research is about enacting change, enacting social change. Uh, in the case of public health, of course, we, you know, it's about many often public health issues. And then finally, there's a communication plan that supports that advocacy plan. So you've got an advocacy plan. You know what policies, what laws need to be changed. But in order to do that, there needs to be a communication plan that supports that. And that's communicating with policymakers, communication, communicating with the media, through media advocacy, or whatever it may be, social media, just getting that 
clear vision out there so the world and, and, and important policymakers know what needs to get done and how to do that. Those are the fundamental steps that, we'll be, uh, that I'll be sharing in these three examples. Two of the examples come from a great resource. I think we're gonna share it. You can easily find it by Googling this. And it's um, 10 case studies from around the mid 90s, um, mid to late 90s. And uh, it was uh, developed by PolicyLink, a wonderful uh, social justice, community health, uh, social change organization uh, in collaboration with the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley and the WC, WK Kelly Foundation. So just shows the example, these three entities show the, a, a very common and uh, often important um, collaboration model, which is community-based organization, uh, academic institution, and funder. So two, the first two examples come from this resource and there are some other great examples. Uh, and the first addresses the issue of diesel fueled bus generation um, of, of pollution that led to high rates, disproportionate rates of asthma in New York City experienced again, disproportionately by communities of color located in Harlem. And the partnership that I'll talk about uh, was led by a very viable organization around a long time, still around the West Harlem Environmental Action Organization called WE ACT and the Columbia University Center for Children's Environmental Health at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. And as the executive director and founder of uh, WEAC, Peggy Shepard said, those of us who have done battle with the MTA understand that they have superpowers that leave them exempt from the basic standards other entities must follow. It operated the largest diesel bus fleet in the country of which one third is housed in North Manhattan. So those of us who have done battle, meaning the community organizations understand that. The world didn't necessarily understand that, it wasn't well documented and communicated prior to this effort um, uh, in a formalized way. And that was frustrating for the community because the community knew it. And it was frustrating for the community organization because the community organization knew it, but policy change hadn't been enacted. And so the, through the collaboration with Columbia University, they developed these research methods. Uh, one was um, geospatial information um, uh, system mapping uh, to portray the disproportionate burden of asthma hospitalization. So GIS, um, geospatial map mapping, that systematic, I see Glenn Johnson from our school, who's a GIS expert, is on this uh, session. Um, and GIS mapping is a very highly technical thing that the, the average person can't do. So Columbia had these abilities and they did this mapping project to portray the disproportionate burden of asthma hospitalizations in Northern Manhattan. Then they used GIS mapping to locate the bus depots in relation to public schools and hospitals and showed that it was an alarming connection. And they trained high school youth to do research. So these researchers at Columbia trained youth to do uh, fundamental research investigating particulate matter, particulate matter and vehicle exhaust. So this great body of information from a established and esteemed research organization was created uh, and the, the data was there. But when you have the data, it's not enough. You have to again, take that data and, and go out that, uh, that, that advocacy step. Uh, and so the advocacy was plan was developed and the communication plan uh, was developed to inform the media. So media advocacy is not about necessarily getting the word out to individuals, Getting the word out to individuals is perfectly fine, but very effective media advocacy communication needs to go through the media to then reach the policymakers who uh, to pay attention to the media. So it was about informing the media, meeting with organizations, uh, media organizations like the New York Times, for example, and providing this information to communicate to them about this link uh, between the bus depots and asthma, emphysema, lung cancer, et cetera. And emphasizing that Northern Manhattan is home, what's home to six out of eight of these diesel bus depots and organizing a community campaign urging the MTA to convert its fleet from diesel fuel to alternative fuels. So in the end, there was policy change. New York City uh, did convert its fleet to clean diesel. Uh, the EPA uh, established a permanent air monitoring in Harlem and other local 
and national hotspots that were similar harm because Harlem certainly wasn't the only place where this was happening. And then introduced and adopted a statewide environmental justice policy. So that's one step-by-step -step example, very briefly uh, described how CBPR worked right here in New York City. Many of us are on this call or certainly in New York City and any, of course, in Harlem. Second example I'd like to share uh, through that resource is the uh, example of um, hog farm pollution in North Carolina. So North Carolina, biggest state of, of hog farming with uh, pig production mo uh, comes out more pigs, you know, are raised in North Carolina than any other state. Uh, and uh, they create a lot of pollution, especially when there are overflows of the um, waterways, the rivers. And here's a photograph of that showing this pollution. And what is downstream from these hog farms is often low-income communities, communities of color. And uh, the partnership in this example was the Concerned Citizens of Tillery in North Carolina. And they, they knew this, they, they saw the this, this, this sickness in their communities. Um, they did what quote unquote barefoot epi epidemiology. They were doing their own informal research. The word was, was out there. Everybody sort of quote unquote knew it, but nothing was being changed. The, 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 the power structures, the racism uh, was in place to not do anything. Uh, until a, a journalist was covering the story and connected these, this citizen group to the University of North Carolina School of Public Health Epidemiology Department, which decided to take this on and work with the community to address this issue and document the effects of uh, this hog, hog farm pollution. So what they did was started with just door by, systematic door by door surveys with individuals, talking to them about their experiences, their health, what they, what they smelled, uh, what their life was like uh, and get this information and then getting doing deeper qualitative research ethnographic methodology to to really get a sense of what life was like and, and identify thematic um, consistencies between different clusters of, of, of families and actual data collection quantitative data collection water sampling getting bacteria counts really documenting uh, it, that pollution uh, that there's no way of uh, denying. And then spatial analysis, comparing wealthier, predominantly white census blocks with African-American communities and showing that in fact, there's a real uh, inequity, a real social injustice and very, very uh, stark racist policies here. And so a communication plan emerged out of that. It was already going on, uh, but uh, really showcasing the, the individuals, journalism, writing about the people affected, um, uh, using language that appealed, that was spread across the state, uh, language appeal to policymakers, language like thousands of gallons of liquid pig feces are sprayed on the field just eight feet from your kitchen window. On many days, you and your family are unable to go outside of the house due to the putrid stench, uh, and on and on. So this kind of uh, journalism, getting people to see what's going on. And that journalism included, you know, photo journal, journalism. Elsie Herring was a real advocate here, um, but showing her case, showing, showing close up of her face, showing this is a real person who's affected by this. Uh, and more and more of these articles, uh, including national uh, news, reaching out to national uh, outlets like the US News. Um, and uh, look at how they, uh, you know, the news, can only go so much with anecdotes, but when they document the, the data, the US News then reports, studies have linked. And so now we're talking about fact, facts that people knew. The community already knew this, there's no denying that, but, it, but the world didn't know it until stop, studies had to be conducted. It's a, it's a sort of an unfortunate state, state of the world uh, in that um, you know, documentation has to happen. Uh, even though uh, underprivileged, under-resourced communities already know it, but that's that's what CBPR tries to do is, is systematically document this information and then present that to the media. So that just shows that the, the, the U.S. News picked up on that. And so the policy change was creating a North Carolina environmental social justice network, statewide environmental justice movement, um, passage and signing of a law banning new hog facilities in the state and setting higher standards for, for waste treatment. But unfortunately, this is a cautionary tale. And, and again, same thing with Harlem, because if you look back at, if you think back at Harlem, 
the pollution hasn't gone away. Children are still suffering disproportionately from asthma in Harlem. And unfortunately, uh, in North Carolina, the, the issue continues, the process continues. So this is a more recent article in The Guardian, uh, only, only about two or three years ago. A million tons of feces and an unbearable stench, life near industrial pig farms. I mean, so again, like 10 years after the whole project. And the product starts by talking about an individual and, and pointing out that the issue has been well examined in the media, the New York Times, Washington Post covered, Dateline, 60 Minutes, the News and Observer, and a Pulitzer Prize for reporting in 1995, but the stench and its consequences continue. And here is another example of an individual, in this case, Renee Miller, who has been suffering from this pollution. So all that is to, again, remind us, unfortunately, that CBPR is not sort of an in and out, problem done, we move on uh, issue. Uh, unfortunately, due to you know, the inequities and the power structures and the capitalistic system under which we operate, uh, it's, it's really, really difficult to enact change. So we can make, enact some change, but we're, we have to remind ourselves not to get discouraged when the problems do inf unfortunately continue. So finally, I'll share the third example, which is one that I was uh, privileged enough to be involved in working at a foundation, uh, which addressed the issues of health and, and other disparities in Portland, Oregon, where I work for a, a health foundation, a Northwest Health Foundation. Uh, and the, the issue was driven by a coalition called the Coalition of Communities of Color. And here's a photo of members standing in front of uh, the state legislature uh, in um, Salem, Oregon, uh, where they've been doing a lot of advocacy and, and lobbying around the issues that uh, they are concerned about. Uh, and the coalition involves many organizations. This is just a, a screenshot of a few logos. The Urban League, Imagine Black, NEA Family Center, Native American, uh, uh, religious identified organizations like the Muslim Education Trust, uh, Asian Family Center. Um, ERCO uh, is the one sort of in the middle of the immigration, uh, immigrant and refugee community organization, Latino Network, African House. So there's African American organizations and there's African immigrant organizations. And again, this is just a few of them, but a coalition that got together to um, raise the issues, uh, wanting, wanting to raise the issues of disparities among these communities. Um, and so a partnership was, was formed between this coalition who drove it, who, who, who said, we've got to recognize that there are all kinds of disparities uh, affecting communities of color in, in, in specifically in, in Multnomah County, which is the main county of Portland. Uh, and the partnership was, was created with Portland State University, which did the research, uh, and Northwest Health Nation, which funded a lot of this work. Uh, and Multnomah County, again, the county that Portland, Oregon is in, and the city of Portland itself. And so the research methods involved simply counting, documenting. Many of these organizations were not known. They were, uh, it was research, refugee, uh, uh, I mean, immigrant refugee organizations that there was no systematic counting of these groups. Nobody even knew how many they were. Uh, they were just sort of ignored. And the first process, the fundamental thing that just needed to happen, happen was figure out how many um, members of all these different communities there were. And then analyzing, connecting those numbers with outcomes, health outcomes, economic outcomes, educational outcomes. And that's really where Portland State got dug deeply into data analysis. Then there was presentation of the data. So sort of part of the research process is you analyze it, but then presenting that uh, and then generating a, you know, a report where the, the presentation, these new graphs and charts are, are there. And the report, uh, this is the screenshot of the cover and it was called an unsettling profile. Communities of color, Multnomah County, an unsettling profile. And the report showed things like poverty, child poverty rate for people of color in Portland, 33%. Um, compared to 12.5% for white children, uh, low birth weight among communities of color, 37% worse, and less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of city of Portland contracting dollars went to minority-owned businesses. There were minority-owned businesses, they just, because of networking and sort of institutional um, systematic racism, weren't getting the jobs. And the report put that front and center. And, you know, showed charts. It wasn't just numbers. It was actually many charts like this uh, I'm going to go through this quickly so you won't see, be able to analyze it, but, but this allowed people to really dig in and see that in this case that the changes, the growth uh, in race and ethnic, um, ethnicity uh, of students and uh, uh, minorities, all these groups in Portland public schools, how it was growing. 
um, and educational attainment, how communities with, of color were falling behind. And so the communication involved meeting with powerful people. Oregon is a state which had a uh, less so today, but a very powerful media entity, the state newspaper called the Oregonian, meeting with the, setting up editorial board meetings with that newspaper, meeting with commissioners, mayor and city, uh, meeting with county commissioners and doing things like producing a video. So our foundation produced a video, uh, which I was involved in, and the video sort of described this whole process. And that was shared uh, with um, uh, conferences and, and, and uh, civic organizations to show what has happened and what needs to continue to happen. So I'm gonna close my presentation by sharing that video. It's about, I think it's three and a half minutes or so. Again, that's what you will often want when you do these kind of videos, not to make them too long. Um, so see if this works. And I will have to remind myself to share my sound and then we'll break out and you guys can all talk amongst yourselves about uh, some of the issues that you think might you, uh, be wanting to be addressed in your um, communities. So here is the video and um, just make sure that, okay, share the computer sound and off we go. As hard as we may want it to, and as much as we try to, uh, we're still not making it. That is one of the surprising to some of us um, and even painful to know uh, where we're at uh, when it comes to real research. Uh. The institutional racism, the unemployment, housing issues, socioeconomic issues, all those problems is the first time that uh, uh, the public is seeing it and we hope with this report that policymaker will start, you know, making some change. If you're a person of color, we can predict that your outcomes will not be the same as a person white. Um, the disparities are huge in poverty, yet we have an ability to be resilient because of our culture. Having this data is shocking, sad, shows disparity, but I'm an optimistic person. It's an opportunity. If we were to measure the uh, a healthy community, we stand by analyzing three factors, income, education, and healthcare. But to give you an example, the economic indicator uh, documents that communities of color are really uh, falling behind as it compares to the mainstream population by a, as much as 30% in income. We have the data and we have the report, and now what do we do about it? We're building capacity to go out and tell the story and look at policies, build policy recommendation. And I've been uh, a part of our presentation to the uh, city folks and the county folks, and uh, it really opens the eyes of people. And they all said, oh, this is appalling. So I think what it says the institutions is, you're going to have to change because the demographics are changing. Right now, we're looking at 29 to 30 percent, um, you know, of the populations in a county are people of color. They have to know how many we are here, and when they're making a decision, they should include us in their decision making. For instance, if we don't impact the city of Portland's hiring and who they hire, then it's never going to change. To do that, we have to put some other people on those committees that do the hiring that are outside the box. I think we have an opportunity here to uh, use the study as a tool to invest intentionally in the communities that are represented in it so that we create one united and integrated society that we can all be proud of. Okay, so um, that was 
the video that we produced at the foundation um, to help again tell the story again. So it shows the video was intended to communicate the need for this ongoing work. It was also intended to share with other foundations this kind of work um, can be uh, and should be done by other foundations. So we, we wanted to use it as sort of a leadership model as well. Uh, and that was the goal. And, uh, you know, again, this project does continue on. Uh, and um, so now I'm gonna go back to sharing my PowerPoint screen. So here we are. And the policy change was establishing uh, the Center to Advance uh, Racial Equity in, in Portland. Uh, creation of, in fact, creating uh, new equity and inclusion positions at the city and the county were created. Um, and ongoing funding uh, was done for, uh, for more research in this area and increased capacity building at the Coalition of Communities of Color to, do, to in fact, do that research. So, Enough from us. Uh, I hope that very uh, brief presentation uh, was helpful and uh, informative in some ways to many of you, even if it may not have been to all of you. Uh, but we would like to take the opportunity now to allow you to briefly meet each other uh, and start to brainstorm very briefly, but we're gonna do it for five minutes. Say hi to each other. We're gonna break you into groups of three. Say hi to each other and Use that time, however you wish, to explore a community-driven health or social justice need that might need to be addressed in your community um, through CBPR. And uh, again, not much time, but a little time for networking, sharing, and maybe just sort of getting your thinking. And then when we, when we come back, we'll ask if any of you had some interesting ideas that you'd like us to pursue. I'm going to stop sharing now. And if our powers that be, uh, that would be uh, either Deborah or John from our school, can start the breakout. You will find yourself with two other people. Um, and I guess because of the numbers, we may, you may only find yourself with one uh, or maybe four. You hit the jackpot and we'll go from there. Deborah, you ready?
Well, I don't know if I've been unmuted. I think I was. Great. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so thank you, everybody, for nodding. So we don't have too much time, but we do have some time. If anyone wants to, what we thought we would do is ask you to, so now we can't figure out the hand raising thing. So in, under reactions, you can do a thumbs up or any other sort of emoji. Uh, and if you would like to say something now, uh, we'd be happy to unmute you. Uh, if you have any suggestions for us, uh, and I'll put our contact information later and soon to um, uh, invite you to reach out to us uh, anytime going forward, Meredith, myself, or Deborah. But for now, is anyone, uh, as we look through any hands raised, ah, Maria Davis has raised hand. Let's, um, so you, Maria, did we, you figured out how to do their hand raising. I, we couldn't figure it out. Uh, how about Maria Davis and then Sylvie? I see Sylvie's got a, a hand raised. Is that okay? Can we do that? Can we start with Maria? Can yes. Maria? So, so I want to throw it to Lena because Lena was in the room with me and oh, I forgot the other young lady's name. Forgive me. She works at Hepatitis C, but Lena was kind of like our leader. So if Lena could say something. Oh, that's great. My friend Lena. Hi, Lena. Great yeah. to see you. Hi, good to see you also. <laughs> Um, thanks, Maria. Um, is Maria, uh, Deanna, and I. And so we just talked a little bit about um, the whole health approach and talking about how we could move the needle um, with regard to healthcare education and using community health workers as a um, as a good way to do that. So that was one of the things that sort of came out of there, and you know, uh, being a little bit more uh, intentional in thinking about how health overall is is pretty connected. So great. So I just want to make a plug for our prevention research center work. Um, and that is at our school. I, I don't have a link or anything, but you can search for it. We're part of the network of prevention research centers. Deborah's nodding her head. You can always reach out to Deborah about this. Uh, and that's run by our uh, professor Terry Wong. And it's a great uh, network that does a lot of work with um, community health workers. So I, that's really all I can say. But if that's something you're interested in, community health workers are great. Um, vehicle to solve some of these issues. And I'm glad you brought that up. So, um, so. So uh, Chris, just to let everybody know that you'll be getting an email right after we finish with a bunch of links, resources, uh, contact information um, that you can share and that will be made available along with the recording and the slides, which will be on our website uh and our facebook page so go ahead all right sylvie you're next you're on you're muted i think we've given you permission okay thank there you, you so much chris deborah and everyone else from cuny sph for organizing this webinar and i wish there were more people from my coalition attending it as well because i'm already if you like a convinced preacher of research within the Greater Harlem Coalition. It's a coalition that's been created, uh, it's a movement more than an organization of different community associations, etc. concerned by the oversaturation of our op op opioid treatment program in Harlem and um, their toxic impact on the, collect on the community itself. And also the the anarchist uh, way of spreading and the way that decisions are being made by developers and by private hospital to plug in services with no oversight and no thinking about their environmental impact and the way they aggravate disadvantages in Harlem. So I've been promoting, uh, in fact, contacted Deborah first to, to create a partnership with universities. That's what we need. That's exactly what you propose, to do more data analysis, more data collection, data mining in uh, three directions. One is on the governance and the funding channeling, or what are the, what, uh, you know, the sources of funding for all these programs. The others is on uh, a survey research on the, an impact study. And the third is more along what you presented earlier, a special analysis, a special analysis. And we need universities, Badley, Columbia, CUNY, and any other city college to give us a research tool to dig really deep inside what's going on, how these decisions are being made, uh, what are the, the rules of the games, um, you know, uh, to do 
you know, I think that just lo looking right now, my, my concern is the coalition focuses on metrics for cli about clients. This is the wrong way to go because it's pinning individuals against communities, okay? What we need to pin down is the funding, the, the saturation itself by sh showing the location, you know, close to one another on certain blocks, near schools, near parks, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. So what I would love to is to continue further. And I spoke with one of our members as well, Carly Wine with a community board 11. They are grappling with the same issue because we are throughout Harlem, um, uh, you know, having to, um, to, um, to live with this situation. But it's aggravating now for the last two years. So it's really um, what my concern is the rush to, to go to media and to advocacy without a clear vision of what we're looking for. We can say no, no, no forever, but we need to present alternatives, either in the business model, etc. So we need your partnership. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvie. And my partner in, in our breakout, Lillian, uh, was did some work in your area as well. So um, there, there, here you go. Lily is, is text is uh, chatting you as well now. Um, so I unfortunately do want to make be respectful of our time. Uh, I do want to quickly uh, plug our um, school uh, as researchers. I, I first want to just give you my number to contact info. Uh, you can those are emails and that's some of my social media um, channels. But I do want you to know um, that uh, we have um, a lot of researchers uh, at our school. And so you should go to the School of Public Health website and look around at our, at our faculty page. Um, we have researchers on our faculty who focus on maternal health, uh, like Meredith, uh, child health, sexual health, HIV, intravenous drug use, healthcare policy, college student health, and urban farming, just to name a few. So you can review our faculty listing uh, or simply contact Deborah as a first step. Uh, and so uh, that is um, definitely something that you should, should do uh, to, to begin a conversation with us because we are very, very interested in doing that. This is my and Meredith's contact info. And this is Deborah's contact info. And I will turn it over to Deborah uh, and stop talking now and we can Deborah, you can handle it however you want, if you want to take more questions or whatever. So um, uh, I, would, I want to thank both of you again for um, your time, your energy, and your talents. And thank you very much uh, for sharing your knowledge with us. This is one of many that, and I'm sorry about the buzzing, but they are doing construction over my head. Um, this is one of many skills building webinars that we will be offering. In the chat, I uh, left you our survey. If you would be so kind as to complete that, um, at 10 minutes after the hour, you will receive an email for us with all the links to faculty, the survey, um, our contact information, and some other resources, along with the next webinar that will be on February 23rd, which is health literacy. Um, this programming will again be on our website and will also be on our Facebook page. So please follow us, Harlem Health Initiative. We're in LinkedIn and we also have started a Twitter page. Um, out of respect, uh, we're two minutes over. Um, any questions that you have, please feel free to send them to me. I'll be happy to, if I don't have an answer, get an answer for you. I wanna thank everybody again for your time, your energy, your talents, but most of all, thank you for taking care of our community. Thank you for the support that you continue to give. Be well, and please, most of all, take care of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Love you, Deborah Levine. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Deborah and Chris, and I look forward to talking to you further. Yeah.